Let's begin. Here we go! Oh. Hi, everybody! Start the insanity. You are not worried, are you? Me? No. Well, we're waiting. Hello, and welcome to Super Media All Stars. We are a weekly podcast, and today we are talking about movies. I'm your host, John Harris, and I am joined by four other All Stars tonight. First one being Jake Boston. Here's Johnny. Anthony Borat. Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You may remember me from such educational films as 2 minus 3 equals negative fun. <laughs> Brent Harris. It's Hyams! And a special guest star today making her first appearance on the show, Chelsea Borich. Hello! <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. You want to tell us who you are and on who you're married to? You <laughs> 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 Just those two um. things. You don't have to. You don't want to. Are you big or little spoon? Hmm. Well, depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, I am fortunately married to Anthony. We're going to be celebrating our fourth anniversary in january congrats yeah so we got a great podcast for you guys today there's uh, some news slash a lot of trailers we're going to dive into at, right at the beginning and then we're going to give you our first blade run of 2049 review today a lot of thoughts there and some diversive conversation coming up but first guys how are we doing tonight good yeah it's nice we got a female presence in here it's kind of Weird waters to swim in. Hey, girl. Mm -hmm. I got my floaties on. That's <laughs> I mean, we've always had Brent, but I mean, this is kind of nice. Yeah, we've had a lot of tits in this room. But. A, little, uh, <laughs> a little extra estrogen. <laughs> so it's been about a week since we recorded our last movie podcast. You guys watch anything good lately? Yeah, I watched a couple good things. They're the season premiere of SNL. Did any of you watch it with Ryan Gosling? Yep, I did. Jay-Z. Mm -mm. Oh, my God. Someone showed me the... Uh, the pants, oh god, I can't remember what they're called, but they like they do like the one eighty zip. Oh yeah, the Gap pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah those uh -huh. are great. Yeah, um, there are a lot of skits that he did that I really liked. I I've been watching SNL every new episode for like eight years. I, wow. I can't stop. I, I love it. I'm an SNL nerd. I don't think I've watched it since Kirsten Wig left. <sighs> That's been like oh, four years Kirsten ago. Kirsten Wig was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was like, four years ago. Yeah, Damn. I know. Like this past year, Bobby Damn. Moynihan left, That's and Vanessa Bayer left, and then. Shashir Zameda left. Who? Yeah, yeah I, I know. <laughs> Who did? You know, you know Bobby Moynihan. He was the best. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Drunk Uncle. The only yeah, drunk oh, Uncle. Oh yeah. The only thing I liked was his uh, <clears throat> Black Jeopardy. Yeah, Black Jeopardy was really was good. Great. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, but yeah, big SNL nerd. That was good. Gal Gadot was last Saturday. I haven't watched it yet, but mm. I will. No, you guys don't agree with it, but I've been watching Big Mouth. I thought I was uh. kind of it was stupid, funny. <laughs> John Attack. It's an animated series about puberty. Okay, it's, it was it's fine. disgusting. It was something to watch on Netflix, and it was it was enjoyable for yeah. me. Yeah, Anthony loves Family Guy, and this looks exactly like it. I like Same animated I, style and everything. I like Family Guy Except too, for but it makes you physically ill. Yeah, <laughs> Man, I, I like Family Guy too, it but this did not raunchy. do anything for me. It is. It's very raunchy. Let's see what else. I Vice Principals and the Deuce. I finally finished those. And, oh yeah, the Deuce. Tell, yeah, the Deuce. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I've wanted so to watch it back in the seventies. James Franco is a bartender um, who oh. gets gets it involved with the mob, uh, and they end up giving him a bar to run, and um, it's pretty good. the The leader of the mob is the leader of the Sopranos in the first episode, hmm. and so it's it was kind of fun to see him oh. back. Is, it, is that the show with Maggie Gyllenhaal? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. it's gross to see her naked. But, <laughs> oh. um, you might like to know that. David Chase is making this, and he's the guy who made The Wire. It's really this good. The Deuce? Show. Oh, it's yeah. been fun to watch. I don't get a chance to watch too much live TV, or I haven't started a new series in a while. I did watch, did a lot of other side projects this weekend, but I did watch, I had the Matrix trilogy in the background, just because mm. I was randomly on Ugh. Netflix, and I actually like the Matrix trilogy, so. It, you like the third one? I like all of them. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it's one of those, I mean, like, it's... I never would have thought I forgot how much I liked it until I watched it again. 
the first one is the, amazing. Yeah, first, first one's, one's a the best. Absolutely. Second one has really good scenes, but the story's stupid. Like them in a rave. That's where the CGI gets so bad. I hate it because well, it gets it's, so it's ridiculous. Some, it's some CGI is it's good. an older series, though. <clears throat> it's an older trilogy. True, but like, what is it? Is it the second movie where he fights like a thousand Mister Smiths in, in, in the concrete? Like playground, that's I love third. I love no, that scene. That CGI is bad. Oh, I love it. When he's CGI's doing bad. like the sticks the pole in the ground and then he like runs yeah. and kicks them. Like that yeah. is so dumb. Well, who was it? That what? Wich- Wichowski brothers? Oh, now they're the Wachowski sisters. Are they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chelsea, Wachowski sisters. Chelsea, you want anything right now? Um, I'm with Anthony. I'm watching the Deuce. Gotcha. Um, it's pretty good. Any boobies in it? There's lots, lots. of boobies. No wonder lots Anthony wanted to watch it. Sold. <laughs> well, lots of bush too. <laughs> too much. Hairy, hairy too bush. much. Oh, yeah. too much bush. Hairy bush. Uh, Way yes. too much. That's a that's that's anti Anthony. Um, <laughs> definitely not a show for the squeamish. There's drug use, drinking, sex. You know all the good things about the seventies. Good old HBO mm-hmm. yeah. at its best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it does remind me a lot of The Sopranos. Well, that's not a bad um, thing. No, no, not no, at all. No. Mm-hmm. It's killing me right now that I haven't seen any of the new season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. There's two episodes that have recorded so far. Hmm. And I think I'm just going to... I'm not going to wait. I am I have some free time the next couple of days. I'm going to watch both of them. I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. And John, I can't believe you haven't seen any since you're the biggest Seinfeld fan that I know. I know. Yeah. I just... I will. I I never got into HBO until the last couple of years, and I never gave Curb enough time to start. So At least watch season seven of Curb, because that's the Seinfeld reunion season. Yeah. It's so good. I think I've seen, I've definitely seen parts and like clips of it along the way, but never actually seen like a full fledged episode. You need to watch it. Yeah, it's amazing. It some episodes are on par with the best of Seinfeld. I'm telling you, that's good. It's good. That's straight up my comedy. So, yep. All right, but moving on, we got a few things we're going to tackle in the news today slash some trailers that were dropped in the last week so first one being the first reviews for thor ragnarok came in via twitter during the first screening earlier this week some reviewers from hollywood chimed in and the consensus i'm getting and you guys can interpret this way you want to as well that it's a good funny action flick but still on a marvel scale of decent does that sound about right i I follow some film critics and I've heard their reviews and they're like, this is the funniest Marvel movie they've seen. Good. And then I'm excited to see it. Yeah. Have you guys ever, have you heard of any of the movies that this director has done? Taiko Waititi. Mm -mm. He's done like what we do in the shadows. He does a lot of mockumentary movies. Hmm. And Hmm. I'll have to look him up. I don't, it's British humor. Yeah. He's only done like three or four movies, but they've been good and I would recommend them right from the get go. This movie has had, definitely a different mood compared to thor one and two thor one and two took itself very seriously which almost takes you out of the movie just because yeah ever since the avengers thor has got more of a comedic side with the hulk yeah i think thor 2 kind of gets a bad rap i liked the ending battle like the portal battle sure that was really cool there's some really good parts about that but a lot of people think that is the worst marvel movie and i don't think it is i would argue that thor one and two are victims to filling in some gap storylines and over to the overall Marvel universe. Oh yeah. That was the worst part of Avengers two was yeah. Thor's just like going to a random bathhouse and just like being struck by lightning. He's like, Oh, oh. I remember. <laughs> right. That's like the, sec- about that. the second Thor movie oh, yeah. was almost just to get the stone out of the way. I forget what the stone yeah. was in that movie. Yeah, but it was, it was the red stone. I don't remember yeah. which one, like anger or fear or something weird like that. Yeah. I've heard this is like a live action version of heavy metal, which sounds okay. really cool. Yeah. To me. Yeah. It's just totally different. I like how Marvel takes risks with some of their movies. And it's based off the... There's some influences in this movie from... Is it Planet Hulk, the comic? Yeah. Yeah, which is good Mm because that comic did really good. It's an interesting take on Hulk. And basically, what people want from the Hulk is just Hulk, pretty much. People just want more Hulk. We're never going to get a Hulk like solo movie again. Just because Paramount holds those rights, so... If he has to squeeze into a Thor movie, a uh, Thor Hulk buddy movie sounds okay to me. Okay. Uh, one of the other trailers that dropped this week was the Justice League trailer. I think this was our second Justice League trailer, maybe third? I think third. Third? Yeah. That sounds right. This one kind of had a different tone to me, a little more, like it still had a serious element to it, but they chose a different song that made it seem more fun action than serious tone that the other Justice League 
have taken. Do you guys, what do you guys, do you guys agree with that or do you think it's a little more different? The song was the worst part to me in this trailer. <laughs> yeah. I hated it. It, tried I, put, it definitely tried putting a positive attitude on it compared to the seriousness of the other ones. No, like, we can be heroes just for one day. Like, they're doing Suicide uh, Squad yeah. stuff again. Yep. I think so? Is yeah, that with the trailer at least. I didn't like it at all. I don't like the new trend in trailers from the past few years to where like they take a popular song and they slow it down, make it super dramatic and put it in a trailer. I hate that. I hate it. It's bad. I like, but out of the justice league trailer, this is probably my favorite one. Yeah. I liked, no, that's the thing. The dream sequence with uh Superman in it mm-hmm. where uh, he's like, Oh yeah. I, I assume you said yes to the wedding yeah. or to the proposal because yeah. she's like burying him with the ground. Like those shots are really cool. Yeah, because we assume it's a dream sequence. Oh, it is. She, like, wakes up in bed. Right. Yeah, that's what they're hinting at. Right. And then there was a scene where Aquaman is just in the air, like, attacking this dude, and then he's starting to fall back, and then Cyborg catches him. Yeah. That was so cool. And, like, throws him forward. Yeah. Yeah, he's just like, your ride's not over yet. And then he says, like, my man. My man. Yeah, my man. Denzel <laughs> shit. And then he just, <laughs> my man. You know, then he just throws him back into the action. Like, that stuff's really cool. And I think I'm going to like this movie. I just don't think I was a fan of this trailer. That comes out in a month, I think. Just over a month? Yeah, in November. It's weird that we're having two superhero movies in November. Yeah. It's very strange. Last year was just Doctor Strange. But now we're having a Marvel and a DC movie. And I think they're just different enough to... Oh, bring oh, in, they're bring, way different. Yeah, oh, bring yeah. people in. So yeah. I'll definitely see both of them. But yeah, I'm I'm guessing a lot of people will see both of them. Okay, another trailer that dropped this week was Pacific Rim Uprising, a sequel to the original Pacific Rim. Uh, did you guys get a chance to check out this trailer? I did. I yep, have just put saw it today. Thoughts? I've put prettier things in the stool. Oh Jesus! What? <laughs> <laughs> I have been more attracted to things I put in my own stool. See, the mm. first time that I saw it was when we saw Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and Anthony was sitting right next to me. You guys got excited about it? No, I yelled no. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I was just giving shit to Justice League about the song choice that they had. Uh, this one had slow down Tupac, and I loved it. Yeah. I love the song choice. Yeah. I didn't like the first Pacific Room. What were you guys' thoughts on that? Uh. Compared to this one, this, the first one definitely took itself a little too seriously. Yeah. The concept was cool, yeah. but it just wasn't well executed. Yeah. No, I'm I'm the same way. I, I think this one appears to be more fun. Which I like. And John Boyega is the main actor. Do you know who he plays in this? Uh-uh. It's the son of Idris Elba. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like 20 years past the first one. This looks like what Power Rangers could have done if they had a little more fun with that I got movie. a big yeah. Power Rangers vibe off this. Especially sure. like... That's what Jake looked over and told me yeah. when we saw the trailer. This That's just what rem- I thought it was going to be when it started was sure. another Power Rangers movie. Mm-hmm. It looks exactly like, like that. This and just reminds me of Transformers. Like, the no, CGI is going to be great, no. but the the talking and the acting is going to be garbage. I think... I think Transform- about a Transformer. Yeah. I think Transformers <laughs> exactly. takes itself a little more seriously with its story when it shouldn't. This movie looks like it knows it's going to be a stretch with story, but it's going to have really good CGI to compensate. That's Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> no, Transformers actually tries for a story, but nobody ever likes the story. Yeah. No, <laughs> no one the, gives a fuck. Eh. See, if they take it any seri- any se- it, seriously at all, like it's already bad. But Transformers are Pacific Rim. Either well, it, Pacific Rim, because there's fucking monsters who just come out of the ground. But that's why it looks like it's going to be fun, because they actually they're showing it off as being a fun, dumb action <sighs> flick. If there's any talking, I'm out. See, I'm not going to see this in theaters. I can already tell you that. Yeah, I'm not yeah, going to spend my gonna money be a to see it. Yeah, yeah. I saw it. I didn't see Pacific Rim, the first one in theaters, and I saw it rented. And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I didn't go. I'm glad I didn't spend money on this. I did like the part of the trailer. Just the, I mean, it's, I almost thought they all showed too much because they showed like what appeared to be like the final creature at the very end, where they all got to team up and they're all facing it. Like mm-hmm. that almost seems like a scene that you would save for the movie. That yeah. geoelectric monster or whatever yeah. it was. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if just because... Ultron. <laughs> Quit. It's not Ultron. Oh I'm not God. sure if they're trying to oversell this movie, but that trailer was... I think it's the first trailer we've had for this movie. Uh, they're trying to sell it because it didn't. the first one didn't do well in the U.S. The only yeah. reason it's getting a sequel is because it did awesome overseas. But Del Toro has no... He helped with the first one. He directed the first but one. But he's not in this one. No, not at all. If for some reason, robots versus monsters... I hate... Like, if, like in Godzilla, where it's monsters versus monsters, Godzilla. or Kong Skull <laughs> Island, I love that, where it's animal versus animal. Yeah, but... But for some reason, monster versus robots is just a garbage idea to compare, me. Comparing Godzilla to Pacific Rim, Godzilla has a way different kind of cinematography to it. 
You you know I wasn't a fan of the first Godzilla. Yeah, and everyone knows here I love Godzilla. Way too slow. Like yeah. the last twenty Godira. minutes should have lasted an hour. Godira. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when the Asian guy says it. Yeah. Oh god, I lost it. <laughs> we just watched the new Star Wars: The Last Jedi trailer that dropped last night during the football game. Mm-hmm. This is our second trailer from The Last Jedi, and we actually got I think it was almost two and a half minutes of a trailer here. Yeah, it was meaty. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least and, two minutes. Yeah, Brent hasn't seen it, and right now he's pulled his headphones off, plugging his ears. And I haven't stopped watching it. I've watched it about And this is going to be a lengthy conversation, Brent, so be prepared. That being said, a lot of things we've taken away from this, but I think it's a matter of interpretation. We see a lot of scenes here. Is there any scenes that stood out to you guys before we kind of dive into overall thoughts of what we can be drawn from this? No mask for Kylo Ren. I think he's going to go without it. I think he is going to take the the dark side role without a mask. Think I, so? I think he has thrown it off. And I think, I don't think the mask did anything for him in the first movie. And I think, well, there's a scene that was him trashing his, his helmet from the first yeah, one. Like right. it, it literally looked like he smashed it on a wall. Yeah. Now, which well, that would be there awesome. You, there you go. Yeah. I, I, think, I would enjoy that. I, don't I think, think the point of him anything. wearing the first one was to tell everyone, Hey, I want to be like Darth. And it was symbolic. I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to be him. My grandpa, I wanted to follow in his footsteps. He used a mask. Why well, I should too. The, well, mask, the mask pertained to the story well, of in Star Wars, Vader. <laughs> but also helped pertain to the audience. Kind of like they want a bad guy with a Vader mask, yeah. which kind of helped bring the series back to its roots. But mm-hmm. we probably don't need that for the second one. Um, some scenes that started to me, we actually got, we talked about the trading card a long time ago, but we actually got a first little, Movie shot of Snoke. Yes, it looks yep. a lot better. I think than it the looks trading. Awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, he looks good. He actually I, looks I like liked a, him in this a emulated old man. Yeah. They show him for like a split second, but I really, yeah, he, I really enjoyed it. It looks really good CGI too. Yeah, it does. It sucks that they're they're already showing that they're going to cop out and killing Princess Leia. See, well, that's that's yeah. that's a point of discussion. Uh, it's, that that scene, that ten seconds is cut so weird because think, Princess Leia doesn't say anything. They just show her three times. She just does the same expression. Right. I don't. I don't think that's how. I it's think those go are down. two it's different probably scenes not, but mashed I mean, together. Yeah, to no, give the, you. There's two. Sorry. To to give you the indication that that's going to happen. I think that I happens don't. multiple times in this yep. trailer. I yeah. was just going to say the second time at the very end, where like it's uh, Leia and uh, no Adam Ray, Ray and Adam Driver, Ray and so Kylo. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ray and Kylo, where like he's like putting his hand out to get her to the dark yeah, side. That's yeah. not, that's... I don't know if that happens either. I think that looks like two different scenes. You're right. Yeah, it does. I, I think this trailer's in... cut really weird. Yeah. So, and I think they do that on purpose. I think so too. I think they're fucking with us. Yeah. I yeah. Think so and too. I love it. I want to get fucked with. This do you movie. think that's fair for a trailer? Can you do that? Can you do that to a trailer to mislead oh, your audience? Yes. Yes. yes it's, definitely. It's not oh, you sitting and being point. like, "Oh, I watched that whole movie through the no. trailer." You were just talking about Pacific Rim Two, to where you thought they showed too much. Yeah. Now they showed the entire have, movie. I would rather have a trailer fuck with me. I love that. Oh, I do too. Especially a movie like that it. I know I'm going to see anyway. What do you guys think of that? Um, like creature that's with Chewbacca. The, the tiny porg. little thing. Yeah, it's called a think? porg. Porg. Yeah, P O R G. Porg. Cute or too much? Um, I, it was on the screen for a second and a half, and it's too much already. <laughs> it doesn't so do it's anything. New Ewok. It looked uh, like yum, yum, the Star yum, Wars yum. version of a Furby. Kind yeah. of, yeah. And I think it probably is there to appeal to the kids. Uh, definitely. It's our. They're already selling pop vinyls of uh, Chewbacca holding yeah. a porg. No. Oh really? Yep. Yeah. Like this is his little buddy. So it's Groot and yeah. Rocket. <laughs> Another thing I really liked about this trailer that we never got in the first one was Finn's character actually getting a fight scene with Captain Phasma. I'm just glad Finally. Phasma's back in this yeah. one. And they're the- like holding like, not sabers, but the electric swords we kind of saw from the first one. Yep. And yeah. What was confusing is... Oh, by the first one you mean the seventh one? Yeah. <laughs> What's confusing is uh, Finn's in like a first order outfit which assumes that he's supposed to be undercover without a mask i've actually done some undercover work on this um there's a toy that says that he's undercover that's in his so garb. dumb yeah. <laughs> undercover with no mask because they don't recognize him from the first one even right. though they should because he went rogue <laughs> right yeah, it we, make, doesn't make a lot of sense but. we get like a look of snoke's ship which is supposed to be huge a lot of space battles we see a lot of the falcon flying through you know what we haven't talked about yet what uh, the training scene with Luke that looks awesome. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that, like, like Lay and Luke. Yeah, that also. Wow, not Ray and Luke. Ray. Jesus, I. Or how do you whatever. interpret Luke's words saying that you have you I've seen this kind of power before? Is he talking about Ray or is he no. or is he talking about he Kylo talking or is he talking about, about he trained yeah. Kylo? Ren. I think we're assumed to think Kylo. Well, no, because Kylo's the or one Darth. that 
yeah, like ruined his whole Jedi Academy right. that he had. That all the Jedi's that he was training. I know, but I feel that could, to me that also could be another way of them mis- misleading us. I feel like there's a no. lot of misleading elements in this trailer. No, I love how Luke is just pretty much going to be Yoda in this movie. That's awesome. We didn't see a lot of Poe in this trailer either. No, we did not. A lot more Poe running. Yeah. Like, that's all pretty much he does in trailers is run. Well, he was on like a spaceship just looking out a window with explosions. Yeah. Yep. We saw BB-8 again like get electrocuted. Do we yeah. see the new dark robot that they've been teasing? No. Mm-mm. Yeah, there's a BB-8, except he's black and evil. Yeah, he's an evil oh. robot. Yeah, I, I don't even know his name. But yeah. I'm just of like, course. why are they doing that? We it's have a, to have a rivalry. Well, it's another. Mar- I mean, it's, it's an easy toy to sell. Uh, yeah. I bet, why not? I bet he doesn't do the thumb up. I bet he does the thumb down. Because oh. <laughs> he's evil. <laughs> Boo. Yeah. Or he does a middle finger. All right, so just w- w- real quick before we, so we can get right back into this. Uh, thoughts from the trailer? Good? Excited? Build, build the hype too much. Thoughts? I'm so excited. Yeah. I was scared to watch it, but I'm glad I watched it because I don't think it... It showed a lot, but I don't think I know what's going to come, and I like that a lot. Well, I'm excited for it. You know, I grew up watching this stuff, so of course I'm going to go see it, and I'm going to be excited for it, but a lot of controversies that, like, like you guys said, I think it's fucking with us. I think that they are leading us in a direction that I hope it's not going be interested to see if it was one more trailer coming out what that does there won't be you don't think so I, no, I this, it. it's too close yeah the director went on record and said if you don't want to be spoiled don't watch this or if you want to come in clean don't watch this but this is one hell of a trailer like he said that the day before the trailer dropped we already got our tickets purchased so we're ready to go yeah on a side note there we had to tickets went live when the trailer dropped during the game and we got our friend group in to day one again 65 days early but how awesome is it that they've sold out so many shows already? You knew it was going to. Yeah. There's no way it's not. Mm-hmm. I'm glad it happened, but I knew it was going to happen. Thursday night, 7.15 p.m. It will. I'm stoked. Day one. Yep. It's going to be sweet. All right, well, let's get to the main portion of our podcast, and that is going to be the Blade Runner 2049 review. We saw this opening night Four of us saw it day one. Chelsea saw it uh, today, actually. So yeah, just like an hour ago. Yep. yep. So it's fresh. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things we got to cover because this is a two hour and forty five minute movie, which could be a discussion of its own. But we're going to take it uh, section by section here. But first, guys, just walking away from the theater. What do you? What are your thoughts about this movie? Three quarter mass. I'm not sure if that's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> I did not fall asleep. Probably could have waited to rent it. Uh wow, I loved it. I I will dive into why I loved it, but this is one of the better sci-fi movies in the last 10 years for me. It's definitely a full-on continuation of Blade Runner. If you like the first one, you'll like this one. All right, that being said, the first aspect we're going to start into is the story. This is obviously like Jake said a continuation of the Blade Runner movie. But um, introduces some new elements that were not even present in the first one. First of all, do you guys like this story? The story being we have Agent K. He is, we learn from the very get-go that he's a replicant. Something we usually don't. It was kind of a, it was kind of a secret through, this po- yeah, through the trailers. You never got that he was a replicant from the trailers. I'll say this every episode. Spoilers for everything going into it. Uh, yeah. It, with, yeah. But like you said, within the first 10 minutes, you find out that Ryan Gosling, Agent K, is a replicant. And we, the movie kind of takes place around the idea of replicants appear to have now the ability to give birth, life, which is a major theme that is played into this movie. And then we kind of learn that Agent K thinks he is this child prodigy of Decker and Rachel. And uh, we learn later in the movie that it was a girl. We find out who the girl is. And there's some um, plays with heart motions with AI and what it means to be human. Um, do these elements work for you guys in the context of the story? I would say out of everything that Blade Runner 2049 has going for it, story is its weakest aspect. For sure. There are a lot of side stories that I like, that I love. But the main story in general, not a fan. I agree. I loved loved the love stories between um, Agent K and his, his hologram. That was probably my favorite part of the whole movie. I mean, that was true feeling for something that's not real and then he's trying to make it as real as possible and it has just crushed me to watch her get destroyed 
I enjoyed all of it. I liked the the main story. I didn't think it was weak in any way. I guess I'm going to be kind of heartless and go against what Anthony said and thought that the intimate love portions of the movie could have been cut out. Hmm. I realized that we, you know, they were trying to show, like you said, um, AI, human versus feelings and being a person and stuff like that. But I just, the the hologram girlfriend was too weird for me. It almost made me uncomfortable. Well, good. This is we have we have a, we have a wide range of top or of uh, opinions here, so all it's only going to get it's only going to get thicker as we go on here. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, after the movie ended, Anthony looked at iTunes and see if one of those things actually existed. Mm-hmm. They do. <laughs> <laughs> She's well. at our house now. <laughs> well, I think the best way to start dissecting this movie is to start with characters. Let's start with Agent K. We're get, we're knowing that he's a replicant, and feelings are initially we're initially led to believe that. F- Replicants are a, are a void of feelings, but that kind of that kind of changes throughout this movie as K starts to investigate his memory and Decker and this prodigy child. He kind of starts taking it personally, and we kind of get the first sense of his emotion when he finds that toy horse in that place he hid in the orphanage. And like that scene in particular was a really good scene because we actually see his replicant like emotion come out. Did that work for you guys? I mean, yeah, when I was watching it, it did. But thinking back about all everything that happens, thinking that like that memory wasn't planted into him, everything he went through, like every emotion he had wasn't his own emotion. Does that defer does that defer anything for you though? Does it, in the context of the of the time frame of the movie that it... No, when it was happening, I liked it. Yeah. I just thinking back on it, it just like I liked I liked K as a main character, I think he was way better than what Decker was in the first Blade Runner. I'm just trying to sure. compare apples to apples here. I don't know. Trying to think back at like who exactly K was supposed to be in this movie, how his role was supposed to go. Like his character was a big MacGuffin. I think that's fair. I think when it comes to Blade Runner, I think you could order from Decker's perspective in the first movie and K in this movie that. When it comes to these main characters, they're a tool to tell another story. Is that kind of is that you guys agree with that? Like K was the means to tell the story, but the story was really more about Decker and his daughter, not so much about K. Yeah, but the problem with that is Decker doesn't get into the actual movie. Like Harrison Ford doesn't show up until nearly two hours in. Right? Yeah, but that being said, I don't think K's story is bad. I think K as a tool to tell this overall story is really good. It could have been 45 minutes less before we saw Harrison Ford. Yeah, there there, are, there are quite a few scenes that can be chopped out of this. I get why it's super long. Fans of the original Blade Runner have been waiting 35 years. So I know Chelsea talked about this, but I liked Agent K as the fact that when he's his AI is called Joy. We don't even, when we first see her, she's like a hologram, but we actually hear her first as a voiceover in his apartment. Mm-hmm. And we learned that he, you're first kind of led to believe that it's a system initiated to help his mindset as a replicant, like to go through the daily motions of having some kind of connection. But then you actually begin to see her and the more interaction you, the, you see on screen, you actually see that he actually has a really deep connection with this artificial intelligence. Oh but, yeah, uh, yeah. Def- definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, they, yeah. and that's a means to his story because he loses her. And in his little portable device of the AI, yeah. and when you, when we lose her, he literally gets tore up. Like you see him, really, really sad that she's she's gone forever. But that's not like when that gets crushed. I would say the audience has more of an emotional crush than what actually like K like emotes. Sure, because he doesn't really do a lot. The only time that K actually like breaks and starts freaking out is when he goes to the actual, like, the child of Harrison Ford and figures out that those implant, those memories, those memories are his? Is that, is that what See, it he is? Thinks oh, he thinks that they're his. He's led to believe that they're really his. Yeah, he thinks that they're his, and he freaks out about it. Kay is definitely believing that. When he sees this dream sequence, it's legitimately his. That's not implanted as, we're, as he's first led to believe. Right, but he goes to her to find out it is real, because she tells him that. But, like, why does she cry? Because she's the one that implanted it. She's the one that made that dream. No. 
That's her memory. That's, that's what I'm talking about. It's, yeah. uh, she made that. She had to make that memory. Though. Yeah, but, but that's that, why she cries. In that scene, it's just reliving that awful memory. She alludes to that it's hers. You don't catch it when it happens, but towards the end, when they reveal that she's the daughter, she's the the miracle baby. They replay the conversation she has with with Ryan Gosling, and she says, "Every creator puts a little bit of themselves in their artwork." And that's what these memories and are. So to her. that was her telling him. Obviously, it wasn't as blunt as, "Yeah, that's my fucking dream." That to me answers that question. Yeah, because she doesn't really want to crush what these replicants think. Like if they find it out themselves, that's fine. But if she has to tell them that, yeah, this what you're feeling is real. So getting back to Agent K, obviously it starts off as a mission to find this child. He's 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 told to kill it initially, and then he starts once he starts thinking it's himself, he gets a little more emotionally involved. But then towards the end of the movie, he finds he puts it together that he is. Um, he learns through the rebellion leader that he is not the prodigal child, that it's a girl. And then he kind of has a turnaround. He kind of has like a personal struggle that he's coming to terms that he's the re- he's a replicant. But we get to see the, him start to care about uh, Deckert, whether he's a human or replicant or not. He doesn't, Kay doesn't really make that distinction or care. Mm-hmm. But he makes it his goal now to make the Deckert and his daughter reunite. Is you, what do you guys think his motivation is there? Because he actually ha- owes nothing to Decker no. or the girl. You guys, th- what, do you, what do you think his motivation is at that point? I kind of feel like he he's a replicant, and for his entire life, he's just been forced to do like missions, like go and kill other replicants, pretty much. Yeah. And he's finally free of that. He's not a cop anymore. He doesn't have any ties to anything. And he kind of wants his life to be remembered in some way, even if they don't know if he's the one who actually did it. They want he wants to he wants to know that he actually did something important in his life. One thing I kind of took away from Blade Runner one and the second one was that there's a major theme of more human than human. That's what it means to be replicant, Mm -hmm. and I think that's way of Agent K kind of proving to himself that when he connects Decker and his daughter, that his life was more than just taking orders as an obedient replicant. And I think that final scene where he kind of assumed to late on that he passes away on the snow, on the yeah, stairs, yeah. that he achieved his goal and he feels satisfied. Do you guys get that sense? Yep. I'd agree. I feel like he definitely broke the mold of expectations for replicants. Um, Which he kind of wanted to do. He wanted to do, don't you think? I think, yes. I think that he kind of with interacting with these anomalies these these other people that were either replicants or just normal people that were born i think after interacting with them and seeing what what it is to have free will i think he kind of started to decide for himself which is breaking the mold of what a replicant is going in order of the appearance here so the next one being sapper morton or dave batista's character he plays an older model of the nexus which is a model introduced in the first blade runner nexus Eight or Nexus Seven? Nexus Seven, right? Yeah, and we're and we're led to believe that his model doesn't have an age limit, as with some of the older yeah, Nexuses well, had yeah. like a four year lifespan. Yeah, that was the Nexus Six model. Yes. Mm-hmm. So his character, we learn, is we're led to led to believe that he's just some farmer at first, but through Kay's investigation, we learn that he helped harbor Rachel and the daughter, and he essentially buried Rachel's bones, and then he kind of was the guardian slash gatekeeper of that information for a long time and the movie kind of kicks off with agent k going to his place to hunt his down his model because they're still trying to wrap up these old nexus models to get rid of them Mm -hmm. hence the blade runner title but i think dave batista in this role and sapper morgan is probably one of the more interesting silent but angrier slash so much emotion in a silent character for this movie i get a lot there's a lot of characters in in this movie like that but he does it really well yeah, he's only in it for like 10 or 15 minutes, but his role is pretty pivotal in helping the plot move along. Right. And he's brought up, like, since he died within 15 minutes of the movie, but his scene is brought up at least two or three separate times because what he did was so important. Yeah. And we learned, like, just from a, uh acting perspective, there's a lot of characters that are silent, but there's so much more to be said from their silence. And I think this guy, Dave Batista, does it 
perfectly in but this movie. I love Dave Bautista. His actions spoke louder than his what, actual yeah, words. Did. And like him with like those little tiny glasses, just like mm-hmm. him. Yes, that big huge guy. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Just like him cooking a pot of something. Right. It's like an old farmhouse and everything. Right. I, I I love Dave Bautista. He's one of he's becoming one of my favorite actors to go to. And even though he wasn't in this movie long, he was one of my favorite roles because I I can't think of anything wrong that he did. And then kind of the next character we kind of were introduced to is Robin Wright's character. I only remember her being referred to as Madame. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Her character is interesting. I don't know her name, but Agent K kept calling her Madame or Madam. Madam, yeah. Her character is interesting because she plays off being a very super serious um, head of the kind of like a head of the police, maybe the head of the detective agency, mm-hmm. and she's really driving Agent K to get his job done. Nothing else matters. But then kind of like a quarter, maybe halfway into the movie, we learn that she's a little more lenient with Kay compared to other. Yeah, it's really weird. They don't really go into it. And then in the end, she helps Kay get away. Yeah, like what? We don't don't really get a clear indication, unless I missed it, of why her attitude changes. I think think she's always had like a soft spot for him because either he's her best detective or best uh, Blade Runner. And like he even gets, like when he's walking to her office, he like gets shit from another officer maybe yeah just, yeah just maybe because that. you know he, he keeps to himself yeah. and they think that as he's not quiet he's got an ego he's kind of a dick but in reality he's just a replicant that keeps to himself he's actually really good at his job mm-hmm. well no in this world there aren't it, humans don't really like replicants and replicants are just That's ai true, so too. they don't really care but yeah yeah after the whole blackout thing that happened humans hate replicants so whenever they see a replicant especially on the force with them they're gonna have a cold shoulder to him for sure one of the best scenes for uh, that character robin wright's character is when her and love interact her office to where is to find out where is k like you kind of assume that madame is accepting that she's gonna die because she's pouring herself a drink she offers her a drink then you see her hand get crushed mm-hmm. by the with re- the glass yeah. in it and then she's like hmm, do what you gotta do yeah oh yeah definitely let's talk about um jared leto's character wallace <laughs> I totally disagree. He was the worst part of this whole freaking John. movie. He was so bad, John. He is not a good actor. Is this from your lack I'm of... really trying. Is it... I love him as the Joker in Suicide Squad. I cannot stand him. That was him. the same guy? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's terrible. I did not recognize His him. His character had, c- could be taken out of this movie and it would still work. You're and it, comp- it's, no, I'm I, not wrong. No, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm, I'm just going to say I'm on the total opposite end of that because... This movie talks about human, what it means to be human, and we're we're told that Wallace is a human from the start. But look how robotic he is in this movie. You have a human who is supposed to be this top tier, like luxury thing at this point because he's not a replicant. But look how robotic has he's become. He puts chips in his neck to analyze things. Those are implants yeah. so that he can see because he's blind. Right, and he also that's how he analyzes things. Look at look at Kay's character. We, he starts off with virtually no feelings, then he gets a lot of emotion at the end. Then you get Wallace's character, who's human, but Ply shows the least amount of emotion of all the characters in this movie. It's an interesting contrast. Here's what I'll give you, as far as leniency, for my opinion. Uh, Wallace's character motives are very weird. Very vague? Very Well, here's what I concluded. You guys can chime in at any point. He wants this the ability for replicants to give life because he can only make so many and he wants to make a lot more for the sake of exploration because he learns that he's he takes credit for settling nine planets yeah and he, he owes it to, he gives credit to himself because he created the replicants he says the beginning that every civilization was built on the back of slaves right that's what he wants them for mm-hmm. but then it's weird because don't you think it's a little contradictory that he makes his fortune slash um title from making replicants, but then he wants to give replicants the ability to create their own life. It seems a little paradoxical. I think he realizes that he can't do this forever. Right. Because he, we've established he's he's human. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's going oh, he's, to yep. he's going to die. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. And he doesn't. And I think he realizes that. So he is trying to create the perfect replicant slash human, uh-huh. so that when he no longer can do this. 
But that's the we can continue to repopulate the yeah, world. Yeah, there's another contradiction there, though. If he keeps on making replicants and they're not perfect, he kills them. Mm-hmm. Why would he want two replicants to reproduce? Like, what happens if they're not perfect? He doesn't have control over, like, him, like, making this perfect breed anymore. I, th- I think it's just a small part. Like, be, having them uh, to make them be able to breed is just a small step in making the perfect replicant. Well, he assumes that... If he gets this child, he has the key ingredient to figuring yeah. this out. And it could be a, something as simple as like a Mad Max type thing where he has like a facility of women and then has them like male replicants impregnate them well, and it turns into like a farming thing. We're led to believe that Tyrell found the secret to replicant reproduction, but it was lost during the blackout when the replicant revolt happened. And like that was the last piece of information that Tyrell held within Rachel, but that information is lost with Rachel and the kid. And for some reason, Wallace, who had taken over Tyrell's company and so assuming all his data, that information was lost at some point. So that makes this child so much more the key to the ultimate secret of reproduction for replicants. And I, th- I still think the, mo- the, my personal feelings are the motives are still a little muddled, but I can see your point that he's not going to live forever. He's going to want his legacy to continue. And if that is replicant reproduction, fine. That's okay. I didn't like him. <laughs> oh, he's I, bad. I'm, I'm with Anthony. There, He only needed to be in one scene. There, When are we talking about like different scenes? This isn't my favorite scene. This is probably my worst scene. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Can we go into it? Go ahead. Okay. When um, Deckard goes to Jared Little, what's his character's name? Wallace. 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 To Wallace's headquarters and then... Uh, Sean Young's character, what's her name? Rachel. Mm-hmm. When Rachel comes walking in, that scene didn't need to be there at all. I felt like that was just like pondering to the first movie. I think uh, I'm, I'm going to play the opposite again. I think that scene in particular, now that I look back on it, shows how human Deckard's become and how unhuman Wallace has become. Yeah. I have more to talk about on Deckard, but we're just talking about Wallace right now. Right. I don't know. The I don't mind Jared Leto. I really don't. I I accepted him as joker i didn't really like him i accepted him this movie he didn't work for me he was by far my least favorite character sure and the majority of his scenes could have been cut and this movie would have not even would have suffered for it at all it it just would have cut 20 minutes out of this 100 percent agree yeah and i think it needed that there were a lot of pacing issues in this movie and that just could have helped move the story along do you at least think that the scene where he goes to see the new model like and then the just shows birthing, his heartlessness. The birthing of the new model. Yeah, that's the only scene that he needs to be in. Yeah. Yep, I yeah. agree. I like the idea of Wallace. I just don't think the way he was portrayed in this movie really meshed with me at all. So I would, sure. I would, I would want to have less of him. And this movie's long enough to where I don't want more than him to understand more of him. As someone who hasn't seen the first one, yeah, having an appearance by Wallace was nice because it gave me an idea of what his role really was. Like that birthing scene of the new model, Mm -hmm. I agree. That probably was a necessary part. Mm -hmm. I would have been, I would have been disappointed if there was an interaction between Wallace and Decker at any point in this movie. And that's the only time they really interact. Maybe if you guys agree, that could be reinterpreted, that scene, but there definitely need to be a scene between Decker and Wallace. I think when they captured Decker and then you, just cut that scene with him and Wallace and they go directly to where they're having like Kay is going to that ship and trying to rescue him. Sure. You didn't need that 10 minute scene of yeah. the whole Rachel thing. I told Anthony that as soon as we it got done, I'm like there's 10 minutes you can cut easily. Yeah. I think there's other places to cut, but yeah, maybe that's how you feel. That's, that's cool. I get it. Uh, the next character we're kind of go into. And I think one of the best parts of this movie is Sylvia. I think it's hoax. It's the love character. She is, like we said earlier, she's kind of the, the lackey slash main villain here. She kind of is the enforcer of the agenda here, but I, I've never seen her anything else, but she plays an awesome silent, another silent character, but there's so much emotion behind her nothingness. Love was just like very robotic. And I know that that's just Wallace's way of like making her like a silent assassin type, Mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. I, I liked her, but I just, kept on comparing her to something I liked even better, so she kind of got dragged in the mud for me a little bit. I think she fit the role. Oh, yeah, she definitely yeah, fit the role. I agree with that. Sure. I just, I think that's exactly what that character needed to be, was this heartless, yeah. 
mindless drone mm-hmm. that worked for him, and that's and, what she was. Yeah, kinda. and that's my thing. Like, there's not a lot to say about her. I don't think... I would argue that she's not completely mindless. I think there's a lot of hidden things there that you could draw from when she gets a single tear in some scenes. Like, why is she drawing a single tear when that new model is cut and killed? Then she gets a single tear when she kills Robin Wright's character. That's true. Yeah, but they never go into why she did that. They, she just does that. I don't think they ever would. But I'm not sure if at this point. But you would allude that there's something more there. I don't, I don't think you can allude that she's mindless. That's true. I, I think, don't think I don't think she's mindless at all. They just don't really go into why she's important. I think that's one of the coolest parts about her character because you're kind of left to theorize. There's more to her than what we what we expect. Granted, at the end of the day, she's still a villain, and she's like at the, most most we get from her is she's like I'm the best replicant at the end of the at the final fight scene. Yes, I was gonna bring that up that we see two two main emotions coming from her. It's either the remorse slash sad. And then that jealousy, like I'm, I'm the best one. I'm the better one at the end. She's a hard character to interpret, but I think that's what makes her so interesting. You know, one of the best scenes that I thought with Love was when she snaps that guy's neck with one chop and just breaks his neck. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. that oh, scene was, was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. No, she has cool scenes and she does really cool action pieces. And but... she has some crazy fucking leg kicks. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> Oh my just god. Her as a character, I just didn't really click with. Where she like dismantles his head yeah. from her. Yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. Yeah. All right, and our next character played by Anna de Armas, I believe, was the Joy AI slash kind of robot. She's, we learned that she's a product, essentially, because she's referred to a product of Wallace, essentially, but she's kind of Kay's girlfriend big girlfriend in this movie what do you guys think of her uh she is my favorite part she's i don't know i just like i said earlier this is the love interest she's very very pretty and it is it's what a hologrammed girlfriend would be it's it's a very pretty gal and and he makes his own meal and sets it down and then the hologram brings this Oh, I've been cooking all day and puts it down and steak and potatoes. I don't know. I I loved her character. I I don't know why I it it didn't do much to the storyline other than kind of play off of Kay's emotions, but I don't know. Perfect. I love loved the actress. I've seen her in other things and I feel like talking about her you kind of have to talk about the technology that's around her. And I really liked how she's just a hologram if you buy the base model. She's just a hologram you can put in your house. But then you can buy upgrades for her and like bring her with you wherever you go. Yes. Like the type of technology in this movie I really yeah. like. I, I thought she actually had great development throughout the movie. Yeah. Because at first you're like, oh, awesome. She's this thing that's designed for him specifically. It, she They actually seem like they have a really good relationship with each other. And then as the pr- movie progresses, it's like, oh, oh my God, I feel bad for Agent K because he's just getting shit on by everyone else. And now kind of his thing that he's infatuated with is giving the same response to everyone else who owns her. Yeah, see, I, I have a thought, a theory about Little Miss Joy. Does she, do you think she actually gets feelings for him? Or do you think... No. Yeah, I don't, I don't no. think so either. I that's think, why I think, it's I think programming. he actually did want to have sex because that's what she thought he wanted. Yeah, I think... I well, think there's a thing- bulletin board for Joy that actually says, like, whatever you want, Whenever you want to hear saying, what you want to hear from yeah. what this program is supposed to be. Hear. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I love that because I didn't really think about that when I was watching the movie. But going back, I'm like, oh, no, I think this is what he wanted and she's doing exactly what he wants. The funny thing is amazing. we see that billboard probably three or four times in that movie, but yeah. it doesn't actually hit home with it hit home with me until the very last time we see that billboard where she's in like her pink generic like yeah, advertisement. Where it's like 30 feet tall. Yeah, but that's when and it kind of... she's kinda, naked. Yeah, yeah. But that's when it actually hits me that, oh, from the very beginning... She's just a program to tell you what you need, what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. What did Kay want to hear? That he was this prodigy child, and she fed, fed, pretty much fed him what he wanted to hear. Gave him a name, Joe. Made him feel like, oh, you are the kid. You, you are, are the, special. I always yeah. knew yep. you were special. Uh-huh. And, but I think that's where that's fake. Like when you asked if she really cared for him, how could, it's too hard to. T- you can't say that because she's programmed to tell you what you want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why I think like. The main reason why I like Kay is because of that relationship with Joy, just because it brings out so many layers of that character. Like, I don't think if she wasn't there, this Kay would not do a lot for me. Yeah. But like, yeah. 
Joy and Kay were a good combo in this movie. Which I makes, agree. which makes so it's, it, for me, it kind of strikes both chords because when when she gets crushed, like you said, Jake, we kind of we feel really bad for him more than he actually shows on screen. But then when he towards the end of the movie, when he's walking across that bridge and he comes across the Joy advertisement, you kind of get the same feeling that he does. Like, oh, she was just a program from the start. And she told me, and this is after he's re- re- had the revelation that he's not this prodigy child, and you kind of get the sense that he's kind of putting two to two together that Joy was really just might meant something to him still, but she was ultimately telling him what he wanted to hear. I think he was a little more crushed than what he met, what led on to believe in the movie when she gets crushed at what the, at the crushing scene. Yeah, I think that was actually pretty traumatic. Yeah, but because he like he's no, at the time. I, I would at the, at the time. Yes, I would okay. still say yes. Mm-hmm. I would say because at that time, like, I think he's like, I'm okay with dying yeah. at this point. But I I think he knows like that's not real and there aren't a lot of feelings there because I think it's starting when, to grow. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But like when he's on the rooftop and she's there with him and she's about to go in for a kiss and he gets a phone call and she's like pauses there kissing. And he's like, oh yeah, this isn't real. Why am I caring about this? I'll go back to work. No, I thought I thought he was way into that. He was. Yeah, but, but I, don't, he, I don't think it's like, oh, sorry, I get back to work. Well, no, no, he's just like, oh, yeah, I forgot, like, this doesn't matter what I do. Yeah, I think that's just him going like, oh, yeah, work first, work first. Oh, what no, we... I interpret that as he for, he got so into the moment, he forgot she was still a program. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And then when the phone call rings, he's like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm designed for work. Okay, we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. The only thing, though, is right before she leans in for that kiss on the rooftop in the rain... Is that she makes the statement, I'm so happy when I'm with you. And he says, you don't have to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the- so for me, that's contradictory. That's, that's, that's him basically telling her as a program, okay, that's not something I need you to say to me. Yeah, but he still wants to have some type of connection. So he might think like you don't need to say that. But if she keeps on insisting that, it's something that he would want. Something like that. I can... I can see why, of course, he'd be hesitant to do this because he knows that, like, you don't need to do this. You're just a program. I get it. But if she is supposed to do what he wants to do, like, be everything that is perfect for K, then she would want to insist on being something more because he wants to be more than something. Or he wants to be something more than what he is. So we talked about this in an earlier, in a side discussion after the movie, but I think it's interesting that one of the most artificial parts of this movie being Joy's character also happens to be one of the strongest scenes where you feel the most emotional depravity when you learn that she's when she she says I love you and she gets cut off and crushed right before she goes away forever but then you also kind of feel the same emotional tug when you all that emotion was just not real yeah that's why like when love talks to him about like oh you have one of our models how yeah. are you liking yeah. her yeah like it's just like everybody has this it yeah. has this connection but it's like a two tw- like an like- iPhone yeah, yeah, no, that like this yeah. this movie takes place in twenty forty nine, and I can totally see in thirty two years having AI like this, and that's scary. Like people would want to be with like computer programs and actual people. And doesn't that kind of speak to us as the audience that we can have an emotion for what we know is a program, but it's like we all admitted that we still felt a little bit emotional when she got destroyed or when Kay figured out it's a program. Like that just plays on what we what we learned in the movie that yeah, we know it's a program, but we still felt sad when she went away. Like I that's. Didn't. You didn't? I, I did. I, I was, did not. I was crushed. Yeah. Two I, things. <laughs> I think <laughs> you say that like a- AI stuff like that is a bad thing, which... It is a bad thing, Brent. Uh, something responding to me, what I want to hear, great. That's not good for you as a person. <laughs> Let's, like, let's, no, let's, say, mean, let's say what technology means to us. <laughs> let's give it to the movie. Okay. okay. I just want to get that out. And secondly, I like how they constantly bring back rain because... When they when Joy experiences rain, it always goes through her, mm-hmm. and then he always does the same thing, but he always like makes sure that it hits his hand. Water is like a very hot commodity in this yeah. movie. Like when everybody takes showers, do you remember the shower scene? It's just like a squirt for two seconds. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. oh, you're ninety nine point nine percent clear of bacteria and uh-huh. everything. Right. Um, Wallace, he's a very rich man. In order to show parts of that. His office looks like it's underwater. It has like a whole bunch of that That's like true. water stuff. Yeah, I like the play of water in this movie. Yeah, and the AI Joy, she's never seen water before, so she feels it and she likes it. All right, there's one part scene that we're going to get back to Joy with later, but we got to move on for the sake of characters. We still have. Let's talk about the daughter, the doctor. Her name was Doctor Anna something, but she. We learned that she's the daughter, but we also learned that she's kept in essentially 
cage, not a cage. It's not supposed to be a cage, but it's definitely it's a cage. It's for her own protection. She's told it's She's for her told own it's her own protection. That she has all these immune deficiencies. Allergies yeah. and immunodeficiency diseases and yeah. so she's kept in this bubble to keep her safe. When that, in that's... reality she doesn't have anything and she's a very important person and they just don't want her to get away. Right. They that's... want to know where she is. It's not a cage from <laughs> Wallace, it's a cage for her own protection. Yes. Okay. I, I would argue that. So, let's we learn that she's the one creating memories. We went over that. We learned that she's Decker and Rachel's daughter. Um, we can, we gotta save the De- Decker sketch up for next, but based off what we know, do you think is this daughter some kind of replicant hybrid? Do you think there is human aspects there because she has memories? See, that's so hard to say if we can't talk about. I mean, we have no idea what Decker is, so that's the thing. We know from the final cut what Ridley Scott wants you to believe yeah. what Decker is, but we don't really know what Decker is, and this movie doesn't really go into that at all. So let me ask you this: from in the overall sense of this movie, does it really matter what she is? What is she to this rebellion? It's almost as if this movie doesn't tell you a lot and just makes you think. Which is probably a good probably a good idea. It wants you to think. Yeah, is that a good idea for well, a movie as a whole though? Even wait, wait, wait. If even if Decker is a replicant, yeah. one, he's not gonna have anything. So I assume it's just something with Rachel where she can just start to develop a replicant inside of her and then give birth to it. Well, yeah, that's Ra- not, that's Ra- never explained either. Though. Yeah, but well, that's what I assume because it's not like they're actually going to give them, you know, like semen and stuff. Rachel is like the uh, Tyrell's guinea pig, right? So it would make sense that Rachel might be somewhat important, and he's just trying to do something different with her. Right, but what I'm saying is, if so, she has the child, and the child is a replicant. Yeah, and the replicants easily able as a child to form its own memories. See, I think it, it can go either ways. It can either go that they're both replicants, and then this does prove that two replicants can produce, or it can even go the other way to where, like, if uh, Decker is a human, a human and a replicant can reproduce. There's not a lot of humans there think... anymore, though. So I think the main thing is just that a replicant that we know is Rachel can reproduce. And I think it's up to you to decide what's more important, because they never, they never really dive into it, or kind of leave it for you to decide, but what's more, what's more important to you? And what you think the Blade Runner universe is for two replicants to reproduce, or the idea of a human replicant to reproduce? Because that's your ultimate your two things here. But you're kind of left to decide what you think is what is more important. If we think about that scene at the end of 2049, where Wallace is meeting with Deckard, Wallace says that Rachel was designed for you to immediately fall in love with her. Like he he said that that was the whole purpose of having those two meet was because he wanted them to fall in love and have that connection. Yeah. It, I I think that was one I think he proposed that scenario but it's never completely defined. It, no, it kind of retcons like why Decker fell in love with her in yeah. the first place. Like Well, he Wallace teases with Decker. I don't think it's I don't think it's the act I think you're left to determine the actuality, but Wallace definitely tries to confuse or lead Deckard on that he was designed to fall in love with Rachel for this reproduce to happen like Tyrell, so, like Tyrell wanted to happen. You think this is just a ruse from Wallace to get into Decker's head? Yes. I think that, I think that argument could be made. Why? Well, what, what purpose does that serve? What does Wallace gain from doing yeah, that to him? exactly. Well, it gains that he has Decker in his pocket. And he and wants he Decker in his, pol- yeah, in his pocket. He well, he's got that regardless. He's got it under his control. Yeah, yeah, but if Decker goes there peacefully, he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to do and experiments does, on Decker. That's never going to happen. Uh, what does Decker have that Wallace doesn't? The knowledge of where the child is. Yeah. So yeah. why would he not want to mess with Decker to get that information out? Uh, I thought Decker didn't know where his child was. He... Well, Decker... He knew the people to get to basically start the... Yeah, but his main thing was that, like, yeah, I don't want to know where she is. That's why I love her so much. But I don't think Wallace knows that. Yeah. Yeah, That's true, too. Oh, so it's like that scene doesn't even need to fucking be in there, huh? Right. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah. Barf. Okay. So let's jump to... We've already dived into him, but let's just get into Decker. He comes in about, what, the last 25% of this movie. This movie makes a point not to answer whether he's a human, a replicant, or not. I still don't think... That's open to your interpretation. Whether how important it is to you is totally up to you. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's 
a replicant or human it's a connection it's a real connection to yeah. his daughter see this, that's that's probably the main theme you get from decker this movie it doesn't make a difference what he is right uh during there's three cuts of the original blade runner the first one totally goes that it could be interpreted either way but it kind of hints towards decker being a human which was a theatrical release that was a theatrical release yes. then there's been a director's cut and then there's been a final cut and both of those have strongly hinted that he is a replicant but it's like the director of this, Denny Villeneuve, didn't really want to go there and just wanted to leave it all a mystery, kind of like the the original theatrical re, the, the theatrical cut was. So, for the sake of time, I think there's uh, there's definitely arguments to be made for both sides, um, for replicant or human. Yeah, I got off track. Sorry, we're just no. talking about this movie, Decker. Yeah, and I think I think there's I think there's definitely ways to interpret this movie, and, and, and that's part part of this movie is just the way you interpret it. Real quick, just mentions uh, Edward James Olmos makes a quick appearance as the origami guy, which if you saw the original Blade Runner, which was kind of a big deal because Blade Runner teases the idea of dreams. Oh, and the, origami- the guy at the like nursing home yeah. type thing that he goes and talks to. Decker's yeah. partner. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's where the his character in particular kind of started the conversation, whether Decker is a human or replicant or not. Um, and then one other character I want to mention was the prostitute. I forget her name. But she was an interesting character because she has some very cool scenes. Yeah. But she also learned that there's her scenes are actually to a bigger plot, as far as the rebellion. So mm-hmm. I that think was pretty cool. I yeah. I really like her as an actress. I didn't see her. Davis. She's, yeah. She's been in a Black uh, Mirror. Black Mirror episode. Um, Halt and Catch Fire. She's amazing. The in Martian. That. Yeah. Oh yeah, Martian too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think her her scenes were really good too. So I, I just thought it was worth throwing her out there. There's a lot of scenes we can we can definitely talk about, but I want to see what scenes you particularly stand out to you guys that maybe we've already talked about or we haven't talked about. Sure. So, it can you can definitely dive into more character stuff here in relevance to those scenes. See, I didn't think the prostitute needed to exist at all. Mariette was her name. In the so movie. Just, Mariette. Yeah, just so okay. that we're all on Thank the same page. So to your <laughs> so Brent just said, what'd you say? I didn't think the prostitute needed to exist in the movie at all. <laughs> Here's why I think she does. One of the best. Sean scenes. is oh, brilliant. brilliant. No, no, no. The reason, oh this, my this, god! This is the first thing I was going to say. My one of this my favorite. Why the hooker needs to One be of my in favorite scenes in this movie <laughs> is this uh, AI hooker K three way. That's one of my favorite scenes too. What? Of course, no. it's your fucking favorite. No, it's not scene. because it's not because of the. Uh, oh, I was uh, so uncomfortable. And in I this think that's scene. why it's perfect. It was so neat. It was just the way they did it. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it wasn't well done. Yeah, I'm just saying it, it didn't need to happen. I think. I agree. It didn't need to happen. <laughs> no okay, okay. Te- so, no technically this is a scene that could get cut because it i know john's gonna have a nerdgasm over there but it doesn't really move the plot along. no it doesn't but, i just i really appreciated the technical just jizz fest that was happening in front of my eyes it was it was great i've never seen anything like that in a movie before and yeah i i like the scene one of my favorite scenes but john keep on talking no i was just gonna say i think this scene in particular is one of the best scenes that symbolizes k wanting to be human in his own mind convince himself that he's human and it blurs the line between what's what we think love between two things is and what reality is I'm that's that's pretty what he's so sure, sure joy the hologram mm-hmm. called for the prostitute because yeah. he comes yeah. home and he's yeah he, surprised she does uh-huh. yeah because she wants apparent because he was attracted to her and she knows that he wants her Yep. So that's why she calls him. I think mm-hmm. this scene, even more so than the, the scene where the beginning when the rain best symbolizes Kay's connection to this AI. All right, I'm with John on this one. This is one of my favorite scenes too. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. It's it's Kay's love story, and this is her giving him what he truly wants is to have a passionate relationship with her, and this is the only way she knows how to do it. Okay, so in that aspect, I do agree. I like that because I think that's that storyline is fantastic. I mean, you learn from the beginning that you you expect something's different about this particular hooker because she's working with some hooded figure, which turns out to be this rebellion woman leader. But you don't know that until the end of the movie. I just thought it was a lady pimp. So yeah, you're kind of <laughs> left. It's like a lady <laughs> pimp. Yeah, I would say probably my favorite fight scene is when they were fighting in Vegas with all like the hologram stuff going on. That was really fucking cool. I With like the Elvis like and that. stuff yeah. in the in the ballroom. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That was, really that neat. was pretty cool. Yeah, it was just super dark, and then they would just like randomly go on, but then like it was still on the fritz, so like the holograms would even be like like off lip sync, like the music would go, and then they wouldn't like match up to it. I really like in the beginning when we first meet 
Agent K, and he goes out to that farm that's in the middle of the desert. Yeah, with Batista? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we kind of see him working his magic where he, you know, he's he's surveying the scene. He looks around. He's, he's figuring out, okay, he's here, mm -hmm. but he's not in this room. Yeah, I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to wait for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, him just, like telling like whistling and having like that little drone pop up yes and, yeah that, that i like cool. that drone yeah. i think that whole that whole time that he spends there at that farm the initial time because i know he goes back and sure and finds the sock and stuff like that but yeah. the first scene where he's there and he actually ends up killing morton where he's sitting there and he's he, you know he's having that conversation with him i'd like i'd like to just take you in but we all know that it wasn't going to go that way yeah that was my favorite we all know my least favorite was the intimate love scene with the hologram and prostitute. It wasn't so much a defining scene for me. It was a bunch of small ones. Like what Anthony said, like the way that they did the faces in the love scene. The scene where they're out in the balcony and it's just him and Joy and the, the whole rain thing. Like that was amazing to me. Yeah. The scene where he's in Decker's room with all the little sawhorses that he sees that he's wood or whittled out and the scene with the piano in uh, Batista's room and then Decker's room, like just that correlation. And yeah. it's the same key. Like that's amazing to me. Yeah. That was just all those cool. small things are just great for me. Yeah. There's a lot of small things in this movie yeah. that I like. That, like, like all we've talked about so far is the plot and that's the weakest part to me. Like, yeah. I can't wait to actually just start talking about things I like. Yeah. Speaking of scripts and like worst scenes and stuff, the worst part, by far to me is like the final battle where it's like in the water hmm. and you can't really see what's going on between uh love and K there's kind of fighting and Decker's just kind of like almost drowning to death and just kind of shoots there. Like I get how like shooting fight scenes in water, especially like a lot of water can be very difficult. It just didn't, it didn't seem like a good final climactic battle to me at all. It just kind of like ended with a wet fart. It was just kind of like, Oh, Okay. We're going to fight. You can barely see what we're doing. Uh, Decker, you remember him from the first movie? You like Harrison Ford? Yeah, pulling out heartstrings. He's almost going to drown. Is he going to drown? I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? And then he's just underwater. They grab him. It just ended very just with a thud to me, and I really wanted more out of it. A lot of people could see it that way. I think it's tough to write that scene because Blade Runner is not about action. It's not about fight scenes. Yeah. But you definitely – there's no – it doesn't hurt to have like a very f conclusive, satisfying fight scene. It, it, there's no wrong in wanting that. I mean, I want that. But how do you interpret that for a Blade Runner movie that plays upon mostly themes and subtle themes? How do you incorporate action into this series? I think the ending for me personally was just enough to the fact that you don't want to overdo it with action because uh, I think people would be betrayed hardcore fans would be betrayed that it went turn into this action flick but like the fight scene was just good enough where where love's character can prove that she's the best replicant that she that she thinks that she thinks she is and Kay's character has enough strength to continue after being wounded and then the final scene in the car where you see love's face and she's like realizing that she's going to die something that she's never comprehended yeah. because she thinks she's the best and you see that in her face as she's slowly starts to drown whether i mean k doesn't you only don't get a sense of satisfaction from k as he's doing it but her personally her character realizing that she's dying like that hit the right tones for me i think it would like for for me love is more of a physical fighter so like i think for me it would have been better if uh, she tried to win the battle like if basically ryan gosling's character outwitted her mm -hmm. that would have made it for me so if he instead of just choking her to death I'd find a way to aware of his surroundings or something like that, and like a situational thing, and then sure. he ends up winning that way. Yeah, that and, would have been more and uh, you, rewarding for me. If you don't want it to like have their cake and eat it too, like what do you call the first opening scene with Batista? Like that was just like an all-out fight, and it didn't do much, but it did enough to where like it was an actual good fight scene. I know Batista as being like a big guy; he's supposed to be brutal and everything, but Love's character kind of had those same qualities to her. I don't know why they couldn't have that. I wouldn't even say that style of fight, but at least like the gravitas of the first fight that Batista had. Like I just like the setup of that fight way more than the other one, way more than the last one with Love and K. Sure. For me, I hate I 
hate the idea of drowning, suffocating. That is probably my biggest fear. Sure. And so for her to go out that way, that was like I caught myself holding my breath while I was watching. And you kind of see it in her eyes too. And you can see it in her eyes that, yep, I, I, this is it. I'm going to die. Yeah. And she was like angry slash sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, for me, it was fitting, but I can understand what Brent's saying about outwit, outplay. And I can understand Jake too. I think it'd be weird to see kind of, like, kind of not robots, but not robots. These replicants like do any kind of thing, martial art related, but like, you never like all they do in this movie is especially in the first fire scene. All they do is just punching each other. That's essentially all they're doing, as far as a fight scene goes. And I don't. I might be. I think it'd be weird, slightly out of context to see like some like like extensive fighting moves here, like out of these characters. What do you mean Why? extensive? Love yeah, likes seen... to use her legs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's... but she, she's also like the top model, so it makes sense for her to have like a little more diverse fighting skills. But, but all you a... see Gosling do really is flip her around a few times and punch her, right? That's exactly what I'm saying, though. Like, she's the more physical fighter, probably even the better fighter specimen. Yeah, so but it makes context. What, right, but that's why I didn't like it, because he just chokes her. Like, she could have... I feel like she could have easily gotten out of But that. isn't that how he killed Batista? It's just kind of like choking him, or snapping his neck? Yeah, punching yeah. him repeatedly in the throat. That'll, yeah. that'll yeah. do it. Yeah, but doesn't he take something to his face first? He might have grabbed like a piece like of a drywall book? or rock yeah, or something like that, and just like ran yeah. his throat. Like yeah. I remember that. Yeah, like, yeah, that's what. Yeah, yeah, that'll fuck. Well, you if, mm-hmm. yeah, if you have a solid object in your yeah. hand and you, yeah. that, that'll. But I'm just like that's what I'm force. saying though. Like he kind of outwitted, and like he knew he was going to beat with be- be- sheer strain. So he's mm-hmm. just like, my fists aren't going to do this, so I need something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the scenes that we already talked about that kind of mentioned for our favorite scene was just the final interaction between Decker and Kay. When they go, when, they, when he takes them, and there's that's like outside the building, and there's snow, and Decker's like, "Are you? Did you need anything, or are you okay?" And he's just like, "Yeah, I'm good." Mm-hmm. And Decker goes inside to see his child, and Kay just kind of, without actually saying it, but it kind of just shows like a sense of subtle, there and dies. yeah, su- subtle satisfaction mm-hmm. that his life meant something. I, I read a theory uh, online. I don't know if I believe it or not, but I kind of like the way the theory is laid out. Where the final scene with Kay and Decker is in the snow and mm-hmm. everything. And then Decker goes to see his daughter. The daughter is creating a scene with snow. But you don't, yeah. you don't actually see what person this uh, thought is for. You just see snow and she's covering up the person. I think I, re- I think I saw something about this too. Yeah. I think it's kind of their, their philosophy on it was that everything that uh, this lady has been doing, she's been putting into Decker's head to make Decker come to her. Which that, is that's very very weird. Yeah, because one could argue how why why does K does K randomly just get her memory? Like how did yeah he, exactly that that's how that theory plays into it. Uh-huh. So I asked myself that same question. Like why did K of all replicants? He just happens to be a really good Blade Runner. Why does he get that memory of all people of all replicant models? Yep. I, don't, I don't. He wasn't like like given. It. I mean, he was when he was made. He was he had it, and I think that I think they kind of allude that somewhere. Where yeah. they put that mem- implant, implant that memory into his. I don't think he specifically. They just like we need to put this in a replicant because well, that's like their procedure. What every replicant gets a memory, that's right? A but bit. that's what I'm saying. Like the whoever resistance, I guess. Not resistance. I'm not saying that the people who helped hide the child put that memory in at least one replicant and just happened to be Ryan Gosling's character. Or was it just a complete random chance that she's making these memories and just? She pulled one from her personal experience and just so happened to randomly end yeah. up in K. Because it was weird when the rebellion said, like, oh, you think that you're the kid? We've had a lot of people say that. Yeah. And she also says, like, honey, we've all had that feeling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that could just be her, because she's, I think, that rebellion leaders also, I think they're all replicants who are rebelling against humans. They are. Yeah. Yeah. So they probably maybe all, in a sense, had a memory, but not not particularly his but they all have this memory that they hold on to. So, I don't know. That theory could fit into context. I could see that. It's just weird. I just threw it out there. I don't know if I believe it or not. I just, yeah. yeah. So, putting all the story aside and all our personal feelings on how we interpret these scenes slash movies, let's take it back a bit just to the technical aspect. Cinematography, lighting, shooting, <coughs> scenes, are the visuals. I loved every shot in this film. 
Yeah, that's I, by far the strongest point of the movie is the yeah. way it looks, the way it pops. Everything was good. It was yeah. awesome. No, Very, yeah. It was captivating. This movie cost Everything. like $150 million, and you Just, can see that on the screen. Yeah. It's all yeah. there. Very it's, clear. Yeah, yeah the, very good. the city is how exactly how I'd imagine it mm-hmm. with you know what they put in the first movie yeah, exactly. and then with today's technology. Yeah, but like the technology of the first movie is just like it went up 30 years yeah. like it's not crazy plus when ryan gosling's flying back from batista's house yeah and they show the the city yeah it, sh- it looks like just a flat like you're just flying over land yeah but it's literally roofs all rooftops and it's just a big clusterfuck of everything especially yeah. what we know of this world where trees are a commodity it's a rare thing to come across a tree branch yeah. and uh yeah, nature know. is pretty much our animals are pretty much gone from yeah. this earth like those little details and it pl- how it plays into the mm-hmm. scenery of this movie, so good. Yeah, Kay had those wood carvings and yeah. he brought it to that merchant. And that merchant's like, "You're rich. You have wood. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. This is real wood. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I loved how we, like Blade Runner one took place maybe in one Los Angeles and that's it. Maybe within like a three mile radius. That's all the movie took place in. This movie, you go from Las Vegas to Los Angeles outside of LA in the farm San Diego Yeah, he goes in many That's different places. That's where the orphanage was, mm-hmm. I think, wasn't it? San yeah, Diego. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. There's st- the whole there's like almost a color palette for everywhere we go in this movie. Like Las Vegas had a cool orange effect, I the love desert that so much. Yeah. Like that it's looked just, awesome. Nobody lives there. Yeah. It's just a forgotten land and, and then of course ca- like Nevada with sand and everything. It's mm-hmm. just like covered everywhere right it's really cool and then like the city had it all its gray tones but then all the like neon effects from the first movie bled over which looked awesome still like yeah. still holds up today that aesthetic mm-hmm. um, I also- even even the first scene with batista the the bee farm or the the farm yeah it was just like this foggy no man's land yep. yeah out of the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. roger deakins is the cinematographer of this movie he's been nominated for an oscar 13 times and some, yeah some of his movies skyfall no country for old men Shawshank Redemption, True Grit, Fargo. Holy cow. He's never won an Oscar. He's a legend. He's a legend in his work, but never been acknowledged for it. (laughs) He's kind of an unsung hero. Mm -hmm. Wow. Damn. Pretty much. So... That's sad. No, I feel... I hope he gets it for uh, this. That's what I'm saying. I feel like he's got a really good shot. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really pushing for him. He deserves one. He hasn't got one yet. Just fucking give it to him. So speaking of tech performances, Rachel's character in that scene is CGI. And I think... Looking past the last few recent movies that really played heavy into CGI, this is the best CGI we've seen. Yeah. yeah. Looking past like Rogue One, who tried to imitate a human um, with some of the dead oh, characters. Leia? At Leia the and, and uh, gen- the general. Oh, yeah. The Imperial yeah. 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 Like, general. That, yeah. Yeah. He looked, he looked very <laughs> he looked off. Fake. There was yeah. an underlining character behind Rachel, like like doing the embodiments of the movements, but the, everything about her... From pulled from Blade Runner One is all CGI effect and it looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she looked very real. And not only that, but like like she looks real enough. But you also know that she's a replicant, so she's not going to be completely real. But what a past for an actress for me. I would have believed yeah. that she was there. Like, yep. Yeah, there was. I agree. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I kind of I, I kind of yeah. figured it was just a real actress, and they just did like some face map right. or something. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's way more impressive than Grand Marth Tarkin when I was just like. Oh God, that that kind of looks bad. Yeah, I know what I'm looking at, and that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention the CGI with like we talked about the the intimate scene earlier. That looked that was really well filmed. I was just and, about to say joy. That was my yeah. favorite part of yeah. the. Yeah. the yeah. That's that's some technology I've never seen before. Yeah. We've seen it yeah. before in other movies, but just the fact that they made a point in the cinematography just to keep showing her fade in and out, like you can see through this program, just to kind of remind you, like she's re- like she's real to him. But at the end of the day, like she's still like this hologram. Like when we see her at the very beginning when yeah. she walks into the room. Yeah, and you can see oh, was... kind of through her. It's unsettling, but like you know what it is. Right. And then the last thing I want to talk about is Hans Zimmer back in action for this oh, score. God. It's uh, great. So it sounds good. So good. This the the underlining he always does these slow crescendos and he does it in Blade Runner just like he did in like he did the Dark Knight, he did it in Inception. Does it again here. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Hans Zimmer's the man. Yeah. 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 He no can do no wrong. No one's arguing then. Yep. Nope. Nope. Yeah. I remember that's, the whole time I was like, God damn, this soundtrack's amazing. It's yeah, like, oh, it good. Hans Zimmer. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's about, that sounds about right. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we learned that it's good to have some fresh blood on some of these older yeah. movies. Especially when that fresh blood is Denny Villeneuve. Yeah. 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 Prisoners is amazing. Sicario is amazing. Uh-huh. Arrival is very good. Now you guys are different about this movie, but he's, for me, Sicario he did, he, was good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He did a fantastic job with this movie. 
Um, I know you guys have your thoughts yeah, on Jerry. No, no. Sorry, no, I'm cutting in. I his, the direction <laughs> of this movie is not bad. Yeah, that's okay. not what I'm saying is bad. Okay. Everything besides the story of this movie is spot on. Very good technically. Very good directing. It's just the story that I have major problems with. Sure. Okay. And then, real quick, thoughts. We kind of we already talked about this a lot, but relevance to the first Blade Runner. The series, uh, obviously, very subjective, mm-hmm. as we've talked about all night, because we all have our opinions on different elements of this movie, and I think that's going to be the consensus with this movie in years to come. Yeah, like I don't think they did a good job of continuing everything that you had questions and everything like that. They didn't. They continued it perfectly. They didn't ask their, answer any of them like they did in the first one, which you know I don't think anybody expected them to really mm-hmm. with how the one, first one ended. So I think well, that this a great job. Yeah. If, if if you think about sequels that have taken like 20, 30 years to come, they usually don't feel like they're lived in the same world as the first movie. Right. But this one seems like a straight up continuation. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I think hardcore Blade Runner fans, I can't say I'm not a, Blade, I'm a hardcore Blade Runner fan. I really like this movie, but I'm going to say I just watched Blade Runner for the first time two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So I'm obviously not a hardcore fan. But I think this, if you were to ask me if this holds up to the first one, it does the first movie justice. Oh, hell yeah. I think it's right up there with it. If not, um, introduces better new things for a modern uh, viewership. That being said, <laughs> just like the first one, it's not doing so hot in the box office. No, not at all. That was to be expected. Well, Was it, though? It, yes. pe- no, people were projecting this movie was going to make 45 to $50 million. Opening yeah. weekend. Yeah, it only made 31 Yeah, well... Yeah. 30 years later, what do you expect? Yeah, I know. I just People didn't care about it in theaters just like the first one. I think it's kind of poetic justice, and I don't know if just people don't want to go to theaters to see it. Yeah. I mean, that that's why I thought it was weird to me, because they had Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford in it, mm-hmm. which alone, Huge like, names. for millennials, I feel like that would be some pulling factors. And I, Yeah, I feel like the marketing relied heavily on Harrison Ford, even though he was only in like half an hour of the movie. Right. I... How amazing would it have been if we went through the entire movie not knowing that his character was actually in it, and they were looking for him, hoping to find him, and then we didn't—he was in any—he was not in any trailers, anything at all, and then you actually see him like go from the shadows, like you do see in the trailer. So that would have been a lot better. Do you think, that would have been really good. Do you think, from a marketing perspective, though, that would have brought more people in because they want to see if he's in it? Like I said, I don't. I was expecting more because of that, so obviously, I don't think that mattered. Yeah. No, I think Denny Villeneuve made. Arrival with a modest budget and it made a lot of money. Got critical acclaim. They wanted to bring him in, give her a w- give him a way bigger budget, and just hope that that bigger budget would help out and get big ticket sales. And that did not happen. A three hour movie. It's hard to sell. Yeah, that too. The runtime did not help matters at all. No, and that also cuts down your screening times and theaters exactly. as well. So exactly. that that plays a factor. Um, so just to show, th- like you, Jake already mentioned, but there's just to throw some numbers out there, courtesy of Box Office Mojo, opening weekend haul was between 31 and 32. Foreign markets opened at 49 million, so the total comes to 81 million just after the first weekend, which was just last weekend. So it, it's on route to at least make its money back. No, 150 million is was, just the production. Not right, marketing. that's not include marketing, but uh, like if it's done 80 so far. And it hasn't opened in all markets yet. There's still like China and some bigger yeah. markets to open in, but who knows how this movie does in foreign markets. I can't, I don't know if there's been predictions out there or not, but I haven't followed it. So it's, I can see this one doing good in, in like Japan and Asian countries. For me, that's hard to tell. I'm not sure if Blade Runner one was a big success. If I feel like, I feel like AI stuff is pretty big. For yeah. Guys. yeah. If the not, technology aspect of it, I yeah. think yeah. it would be a big hit. Especially if like they like the visually entertaining Plus, stuff. I think, I help. think the international, Harrison Ford will actually have more pull internationally than he will actually domestically. I don't know. That's hard to tell. I don't know those. Yeah, it's kind of tough. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I I can pretty much tell you for a fact it's not going to make its budget back. It might make the $150 million, but... You don't think it'll make all of it? I would say to break even, it would need to make around $300 million worldwide. I don't see this doing that at all. No, I think it's maybe it's going to become one of those cult classics that has its hardcore following just like the first one. Yeah, which is... Yeah, exactly. It's funny to say that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We discussed some major performances and what we thought about them. Do you think come we Jake, you mentioned the director, you mentioned the what, the film editor? The, the cinematographer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Hans Zimmer. Very subjective around this table. But what do you guys feel like for um, awards? This movie 
this movie stand a chance anywhere? Especially like visuals and I yeah, think it'll definitely be nominated. It's hard to say if it'll win. Yeah. Anything, but I know it'll be a in contender. a lot of the nominations. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like the acting for some of them and then the <laughs> cinematography. Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't think any acting is going to make you don't think any so? list. I don't think so. I think no, some I will. Think I think some will. Harrison Ford win might. anything. I don't think so. No? No. You don't think Ryan Gosling's character won't? No. I think Sylvia Hoax might will. She's a brand new actress, never been in anything else, and she makes a big debut in this movie. I mean, even with Arrival, that nothing, no actor got nominated for anything. It was just visual effects. Yeah. This one, I'm guessing we'll get visual effects. I'm guessing we'll get score. I'm guessing... Yep. It might even get script, original script, but yeah, any I, I don't think actor wise it'll get anything. Yeah. That being said, Chelsea, you are our guest tonight. We do a five star rating. Yeah. Five being the best, one being you know, zero stars being the worst. <laughs> Where would you rate Blade Runner twenty forty nine on a five scale star rating? Um, I was thinking somewhere between either a three or a three point five. You know, and I haven't seen the first one, so I don't have any comparison. I didn't know the beginning of the story. This was just completely new material for me. Sure. And, you know, what really drew me into wanting to go see this was Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling. They're they're two really great actors, and so that's what drew me in. And, and the fact that, you know, it was a different take on society. So I'll give it a three and a half. Anthony? Again, the, uh, there were holes in this movie for me. It just wasn't maybe made for me. Um, and, and I hate to, to throw in my negative because it was, you know, I, I think it was well done. I think the actors were, were great in it. And like I said, it was one of my favorite love stories in it. Uh, with all of that being said, I'm still going to still go with my 2.5 uh, rating. Um, as it's about the same feeling I had after Kingsman where... I'm glad I watched it, but I will never watch that movie again. All right. Please, uh, please don't have a coronary. <laughs> Come <2. on>. <laughs> <laughs> I left the movie theater ranking it at four. But since then, with what's happened with some of the things I th- thought about after I left, I don't know, I felt so damn good about it when I right after I got done seeing it. But then I got to processing it and... I got to come down to a 3.5. All right. <laughs> Last movie podcast. I compared my hype for this movie to Mad Max Fury Road. Mad Max is good. God. Mad Max, I would give a five out of five too. Yeah. yeah. That movie is amazing. Yeah. It's a modern classic. This movie, I feel like definitely not as good as Mad Max Fury Road. I'm just going to say that right now. No. So it didn't live up to your hype. I would say the world of Blade Runner sucked me in as much as the world did to Mad Max. Just the story to Blade Runner really... The post-apocalyptic really... theme. To Mad Max? Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's all good. Just everything that I like about an action movie was in Mad Max. Everything that I like about a sci-fi movie was not in Blade Runner. Blade Runner thinks way too highly of itself, and it doesn't have the plot to back it up, in my opinion. I would say graphics, 3.5. I would say story Story brings it down a lot. If I had to rate this movie, which I have to, out of five stars, I'm going to give it a 3.5. The same as you, Brent, so don't... No, I know, but your comment about rating the story, like... That's his opinion. I know, I know, but the AI, yeah. like, does that not intrigue you at all? Like, the AI th- part of it? No, it does. I, my thing is, like, this movie had very similar elements and story plot points to her and Children of Men, both movies that I like way better than this movie. I would give her a four and a half. I would give Children of Men a five out of five. This movie, I don't think, comes close to the high points of either of those films. So I'm giving it a 3.5. Uh, all fair. All fair st- uh, arguments here. For me, I'm a big fan of sci fi movies. I love movies, for me personally, that make me think. And I had to do some thinking after this movie just because I like to interpret things. And obviously, there was obviously. As we discussed, the movie leaves a lot open to interpretation and how you interpret the movie, which I think is part of Blade Runner, but also part makes a good for makes it for a good theater experience for me personally. So I liked I liked almost all the performances in this movie. I love the technical aspect of this movie. 
Not that the director did a good job. I, wa- I definitely wanted to do better in theaters, but for me personally, I'm going to give it a 4.5. It is probably one of the best movies I've seen this year, and there's been a lot of good movies this year. 2017 has been a good year for movies, but it this sure is definitely has. takes one of the um, top contenders. And like I said, I'm, I'm a sucker for sci-fi, and I think this has definitely been one of the best sci-fi movies in the last 10 years. So, But I'm really excited to come and see or just remember how many good movies I've seen this year because there's been a lot. Yeah. There has. Yeah, this has been a strong year. And we got we still got a few more to go. So look forward to that as we got a lot of, of movies course. coming up. Uh, but like I said, go see Blade Runner. Let us know what you think. Yeah, please, because I might not have liked the movie that much, but it definitely has a lot of conversation that you can and, have. And don't let it. my 2.5. It, it was a good movie. Again, it wasn't for me. 2.5 is average. So it's like, go watch it. It's a it good was watch. Good, it was a good movie. And yeah. d- uh, take it for what it's worth. I feel like I don't know why, but I have some. I have this feeling when I watch it again, it's gonna bump up to a four for me. Sure, and that might happen. Like this is a first view review, so it might happen to where like you see it again, some more plot points make sense. That yeah. can totally happen. You might catch some more things that you didn't see the first go. Yeah, round. I yeah. always or, do that with movies. Or like the mm-hmm. things that are holding me back from giving it a better rating, like in the grand scheme of things, after I watch it again, just have such a minimal feeling on it. Sure. <laughs> But moving on, now it's time to play our trivia game, one of my favorite parts of this podcast. Woo! And how this works is Brent is our clip master, and it being a movie podcast, we'll have some movie clips to guess at. It tells you how this works is Brent's going to play a clip, and the first one to yell the name, not yell, but guess the name, is takes the point. There'll be four points up to grabs with a possible tiebreaker if it comes down to that. You can guess as many times as you want. Uh, um, I have a feeling this isn't going to go well if, for me. <laughs> if we don't get the clip, Brent gives, Brent gives us details. So, yep. Brent, that being said, can you drop clip number one on us? All right. Clip number one. Who have you told? No. Who have no you one, told? No one. I swear to God. <laughs> you swear to God. You crazy. Predator? I swear to God. I didn't. Well, then I guess I believe you. Italian job. Yes, Edward Norton. Boom. God damn it. Oh, I knew it was Edward Norton. Damn on it. the board, our guest. Why do the guests <laughs> always do well? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do well at this. <laughs> Chelsea's on the board with her first point with Italian God, nice job. Nice to go. that text from Brent with all the answers? <laughs> what? <laughs> I've been had. <laughs> All right. We got ourselves Damn a game, it. man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Clip number two, friends. Five corners, but it's behind ten inches of steel. So you can't get in there without the keypad combination. I, 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 I can give that to you. I don't need your cooperation to get the combination for me. Salt? Transformer. Salt? Charlie's Angels. Ex Machina? Go. Get out of here. I feel like I've seen it this It kind of sounded like Lucy Liu. Nope. Huzzah! <laughs> Got ourselves a stumper, folks. Huh. All right. This is actually a really popular film, so and it was really hard to find an obscure clip. All right. All right. We'll go with uh, 2012. New-ish movie. Action, crime, sci-fi. These I'm actors really are going to give it away. Good, so, I'm ready. Lena Hetty. Dread. Boom. Yes. I've never seen Lena Hetty's the... Judge Dredd? Have you seen Dread? No, just no. Dread. Oh, She's yeah. the chick in uh, Game of Thrones. Yes, yeah, she is. And Carl Urban. I knew I've seen yeah. that movie before. Yes. Yeah, that was a very weird clip, Brent. Yeah, it was. So Jake jumps on the board with one point. So we're two points in. Brent, can you drop clip number three on us? Oh clip <laughs> number three. Here we go. Do you know how hard it is to make it as an indie band these days? There's so many of us. They're Frank? all so cute. And it's like if you don't get on Letterman or some retarded soundtrack, you're screwed. Okay? Satan is our only hope. Green room? We're in league with the beast now. And we have to make a really big impression on him. And to do that, we're going to have to butcher you and bleach you. And then Dirk here is going to wear your face. It's going to be a dark clip. I have no idea what this is. All right. Uh, released in 2009. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we got an olden. 
that, that's not old. old. Dirk Harry Two thousand nine. I was a senior God, in high school. I know school. what that's from. I'm trying to think of like a horror movie with an indie band. Oh God! <laughs> it is a comedy horror. Shocker! Scream! God, that's how I knew I knew what this was from. Da-da. Jennifer's body. Boom! Oh! Oh! God damn it! I never knew. seen it. Never seen oh, it. My God! <laughs> Chelsea gets two points. Damn. <laughs> Holy Bust shit. In. I right. am flabbergasted right now. Chelsea with two, Jake with one, How and me. Once again, me and Anthony remember with that? zero. <laughs> I remember. Oh, oh God. It was a yeah, terrible, I remember. <laughs> such a terrible movie. <laughs> hey, <laughs> come on. With Megan that That's how I remember, because <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, Brent, we need clip number four. four. Yeah. Going down the four. This is for the tiebreaker. Yeah, I know. Or to secure her win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I get it, it'll go to a tiebreaker oh, yeah. between yeah. me and you. All right. If you do not dance, you have no purpose. And we don't keep things here. Coyote ugly? We have no purpose. You see your fight for survival? Fuck. Starts right now. Hunger oh, Games? No. You don't want to be Wonder judged. Woman? You won't be. You don't think you're strong enough? You are. You're afraid. Step up. Don't be. You have all the weapons you need. I hate Hannah? Nope. This movie selection is terrific. Step up too? <laughs> <laughs> no. The streets? <laughs> yeah. No. Who the hell offered these up to you? <laughs> Nobody. I took them all. Oh, myself. Uh, 2011. Action fantasy. Okay. Uh, Vanessa Hudges. Hud- Huggins? Hudges? Spring Breakers? Huh? Spring Breakers? No. Vanessa Hudgens, wait. <laughs> wait. High School Musical 2. Shut up. No. <laughs> oh, God. There's a key point in the clip. Oh, um, um, uh, Sucker Punch. Boom. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah. Damn. Bad movie. Whew, that's a really I, bad movie. That was a terrible movie. I think yeah. I only saw that once. That's all you need that to was see. A, that was a hot that was piping enough. tur is what that was. Oh. oh, well, me and John are out. <laughs> yep, as always. <laughs> oh, that's not true. I went some. I've and you've won, won one. This is a tight game, game, game. My oh, God. Game All right. Oh, no. Hmm. Tiebreaker time, Brent. Ten Clip from five. Breaker. You ready? Right. Sure, I guess. <clears throat> All right. We humans like to think we are nature's finest achievement. I'm afraid it just isn't true. This archaic sand beetle is superior in many ways. It reproduces in vast numbers. Has no ego. Has no fear doesn't know about death and so is the perfect selfless member of society but humans have created art mathematics and interstellar travel really nope what nope all right uh 1997 all right oh boy uh i should probably have guessed action adventure sci-fi okay the mummy no We'll go actors. Okay. Dina Meyer. Nope. Okay. Denise Richards. Wild Things? No. Denise Richards. The World Is Not Enough? The You'll world... get it here in a second. Am I right? No. The World Is Not Enough? No. no. Denise Richards. I know that name, but Sci-fi. I can't. Sci-fi. can't. All right. Here's the kicker. Oh, yep. uh, uh, Starship Troopers. Yep. Okay. Damn it. God. Neil Patrick Harris and Casper Van Dien. I've never seen the movie. Of course you have I've never yeah. seen it. I was going to say Space yeah. Odyssey. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you this were wrong. reason we weren't in it. <laughs> Starship Troopers. Yep, never seen it. That's Despite a-, a valiant effort by our guest, Jake walks away the winner tonight with three points on the tiebreaker. I feel kind of bad about that one. I kind of wanted Chelsea to get it. Yeah, the Star Trek Troopers. Yeah, it's not the best note to end. <laughs> no, it's not. That's a wet fart right there, bud. Okay, so yeah, because you guys have seen it. Nope. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Is that anything. the one about the bug planet? Yeah. 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 That's a decent sci-fi movie. Yeah. Isn't it like a so bad it's good sci-fi movie? Actually, yeah. I think I have yeah. seen it. It's got like the little bugs that walk around that yeah, chomp in the front, yeah, and yeah. it's got the mother brain that Neil Patrick Harris yeah. talks to. Yeah, sounds great. Damn, All right, that, that makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that being said, this has been episode 13 of Super Indie All-Stars. We thank you for joining us. Please, please, please 
like and subscribe on YouTube. All you gotta do is click the little button to subscribe. Please subscribe to us on the podcast services. All you gotta do is hit subscribe and you'll get our weekly episodes. Please find us on Twitter at Super Media All Stars. Please find us on Instagram at Super Media All Stars. Jake, would you like to plug? Um, I have a Steelbook account on Instagram at Steelbook Obsessed. We're I'm close to 450 followers now. Just keep on racking them up. Uh, I've almost I'm, I think I'm like three away from my hundredth Steelbook. So yeah. Oh wow, how time flies. Uh, as far as movies go for the rest of the next couple months, um, there's Happy Death Day that is up in the air for reviews for some of our guys here. I'm definitely wanting to see it. So. Me too. There's mm-hmm. definitely a Medea Boo 2. There's definitely <laughs> that. <laughs> I'll be watching that. Uh, one I'm interested in, we'll probably get to before Thor Ragnarok, is The Snowman, which oh, looks yeah. like a yep. good murder. I think we need to talk about that one. Murder oh, sci-fi, yeah. be, I think be a good one to see. Yep. But then we also have Thor Ragnarok, Star Wars, a lot of good stuff still to come from movies this year. So please stay tuned with us for that. Mm-hmm. That being said, thank you for joining us tonight, and we will see you next time. Goodbye, and have a pleasant tomorrow. See you. Game over, man. Game over. Bye-bye. <laughs> I am out of here.